What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with, or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. Today, I've got a guest on the show who is an ad maven. Um, his name is Jason Harris. He is the founder and CEO of ad agency Mechanism. That's Mechanism with a K. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the Creative Alliance. He is a best-selling author of the book, The Soulful Art of Persuasion. He was named Small Agency of the Year by uh, Ad Age twice. The guy is an assassin um, in the world of advertising. Uh, I'm really, really excited to talk to him. I got so many damn questions um, as advertising is essentially what makes the world go round in today's day and age without a question of a doubt. Uh, Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Great to be here. I'm stoked. So I'm glad you called me an assassin, but then said in advertising. Because <laughs> that would be a different interview, but also a good one. Well, you know what, man? I feel like advertising is is such a broad uh, the 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 world of advertising covers so many different categories, and uh, it's it's like a very broad arena advertising. Um, and I'm I'm sure that you well you definitely know that better than I do. Um, but let me just give you a quick rundown. Born or Made is a podcast where we like to discover whether or not you believe you were born to do what you do today or if you were made over time. Um, and uh, we've had some great, great answers along the way. I mean, I think this is episode number 72. I think, Matt, is it 72? Is that where we're at? Yeah, that's correct. Yep, we're at 72. So you're the 70 deuce. Um, <laughs> And so, so it's like yeah. uh, it's nature versus nurture. That's like that's uh, it. That's, that's the, the that's the question, right? right? That you've been and after 72, 71 siete uno episodes, do you have an opinion? Oh, I know my I've always had an opinion. I believe that everybody is born with an inherent skill set, talent, ability, uh, superpower, and the mission in life is to get to that skill set as quickly as humanly possible and then capitalize on it. Um, that's what I believe. I believe everybody's born with something special. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we, we tend to bang our heads against the wall trying to do shit that we're not supposed to be doing. Um, and so my, my uh, philosophy on that, similar to my philosophy on hiring is like, you know, Hire slow, fire fast. Um, yeah, if totally. something if something is not working out, like move on to the next. Um, that's sort of just the way I I like to do it. If you continually feel like you're pushing a boulder uphill and it's not getting any easier, it keeps falling, you know, rolling over you. It just get out of the fucking way and find another boulder to push. You know what I mean? That's not um, your boulder. That's not your boulder. That's not your boulder. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> there good. we go, dude. That's your next fucking tagline. Uh, that's I'll pretty take, good, man. That's not your boulder. I'll take, uh, I'm going to write that one down. I like that. That's yeah, not that's your boulder. Good. Um, so, you know, I, the way we like to get to this answer potentially, and, and I won't ask you the actual question until the very end of the episode, but the way we like to get there is to hear your story. You've obviously got a really interesting, cool story. I have so many questions about advertising because, um, you know, there's like there's like a real stigma about advertising. I mean, there was, you know, there was Mad Men back in the day. Um, social media, uh, I'm, I can only imagine, has taken a massive or made a massive impact on the world of advertising. Um, I'm sure in some really positive ways and also some in, in some not so positive ways. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to learn all about that. But first, I would really love to hear your story uh, because you've got a cool one. 
And um, I would love to hear it from your, from you. Yeah, sure. And I'll, before I go uh, to the beginning, the idea, I just want to touch on something you said before I forget it, because in advertising, we all have ADHD, like that's predominantly the people that I hire, <laughs> uh, because we work on a variety of clients. So we're always jumping from you got to learn something really quick and then jump to another client and learn that industry really quick. So we're kind of wired that way. But when I wrote the book, The Soulful Art of Persuasion, it really came from, I had read a Gallup study that said the, the top three most dishonest or least trustworthy professions in the world were number one, politician, no surprise. Number two, car salesman or salesperson. That's not a surprise. And number three was advertising practitioner. And so for me in advertising and sort of being, you know, carrying the banner of the industry, I felt like there's another way where you can persuade and influence and convince people both in your personal and in your business life. And it doesn't have to be dirty. It doesn't have to be what people think of advertising as brainwashing or getting people to buy, you know, conspicuous consumption for things that they don't need. And so that was sort of the emphasis or the, the impetus for the book. And I, that's kind of what I fought against and came up with a um, sort of four principles that I've built the business on and that I think are important for, you know, everyone really. And so that, that's interesting that you say that because we, we still have a stigma about what we do. You know, I, I, I think you bring up a really great point. And it's interesting that I was having a conversation with a friend about this last night. Um, if there's one thing I believe to be uh, integral for successful businesses, and it's not all the time, but when I say successful businesses, I mean businesses with legacy, businesses that don't just rise and fall, uh, businesses that potentially don't have the you know, exponential spikes, um, but that build year over year, you know, like just, just in perpetuity. Yeah. Like, um, com like compound interest builds exactly. in your portfolio, just over time, over time, over time. Right. Yeah. And so I think that, that, that is what really sort of defines the health of a successful business, right? When you can actually look at the numbers and say, okay, well, these, this, this company might not be driving the most revenue in the industry. But if you look at their historic track record, they have grown every single year, um, potentially not every single quarter, but every single year there's been, there's been growth. And I believe that authenticity is integral. If you cannot stand behind the product because it means something to you, and it doesn't like in your, in your business, I'm sure that you have core values, morals that are internal for your company. Definitely. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have the same exact core, va core values, morals, you know, um, uh, uh, pillars for every single one of your clients. But if you stand behind the core values of your company and then you apply those to any, any project you're working on, that shines through every single time. For me in business, and I've opened up a number of businesses, everything that I've sold has been an extension of me. I yeah. cannot fucking fake it. And I feel like faking it is ultimately the demise of most empires, right? There are, we've seen some unbelievable businesses that have gone from zero to, to infinity and then pff, yeah. fizzle, just Definitely. completely fizzle. And so, you know, I, I, I would love to hear your four, um, your, your four, uh, whatever, whatever they're called. Uh, principles. Principles. Yeah. yeah. So I have those for the book, but then I also, every, every time we meet with a new client, we do have company values that we talk about because it's important to us that if we're going to work with someone, they know what we stand for. What's that drink? Oh, this like, is uh, that's some star, that looks like some Star Trek shit right there. That's uh, that's my blue essential amino acids that I drink all throughout the day. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, I don't even know what that is, but I gotta get them. 
So, yeah, so it's important for us that we match up with a company that even if they don't match our values, they understand our values so they know where we're coming from. And that's really important. We've turned down a lot of business that, that doesn't match our values. So that's a really good note that you said that. Um, but before we get to that, I'll go back to your original question and give you the, because I want to stay on your flow of how you do things, but how I got started, like how I got into advertising. No, I want to know. I want to know. I'm talking about way back, man. I want to know what, what like Jason when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was born in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. You know where that is? Outside no. of D it's outside of it's like 12, 12 miles outside of DC, but I was born in the ver suburbs of Virginia and I was born to two teachers and they were like bookworms read all the time didn't really go and it, travel or experience things they were just like always re always at home reading and and teaching and i that wasn't me you know i wasn't like a bookworm when i was growing up so i was always out exploring getting into trouble with my friends you know from a young age and i started how i sort of the, the there's two things that sparked my love of like branding and advertising and that was uh tv so I, I i watched a lot of tv when i wasn't out running around and um i really in between the shows that's when people watched ads on tv which obviously they don't anymore but i would study the ads that were shown in between and i'm talking like i don't know maybe 11 or 12 and I would study those ads and and see if they appealed to me and I'd kind of dissect them and really think about them and I also realized that can I stop you there for a second yeah sure so so this is a great this is a great little moment um so you're 11 and 12 years old you are watching television and you're analyzing the commercials yeah do, do you can you recall like um yeah, it's weird. What inspired? Right? Yeah, I mean, what 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 motivated you to want to do that? Was that just something that naturally came to you that you were like, hmm, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually dig into this? Yeah, it sort of. Um, oh, I just it always sparked my interest, and I have no idea why. But I would watch like Lego My Ego or the Kool Aid Man, and I would look at those ads and say, All right, why is that going to sell this thing? Why do I love the Kool Aid Man? And I would kind of like think about it in another level, not just blindly watch the ad. And that I didn't realize at the time, like, oh, I should advertising is a career and something I should go into. I just was interested in those interstitials in between the shows I was watching. And it's sort of, I was interested in, in a deeper way than, you know, most, most other people. Uh, and that sort of, that was one thing when I look back on, Mm, that was kind of weird you know it did you like, know that then or or is that only now that you're sort of now in, in reflecting i i know that but i knew that i liked watching them and i knew that i thought about them but it, i didn't really make a connection with uh well oh you can do that as a career and make money and start a business and i didn't you know think all the way through that i thought it was i thought it was just interesting oh that's something i'm kind of into and then i i joined the kiss army so I was really into Kiss, and I um, they would send they're the, they're kind of like the world's first uh, influencer marketing because they side note I dated yeah. Ace Frehley's daughter for about a year. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, I did. Monique. Well, did you meet Ace Frehley? No, I never met him. You're kidding me. I never met him. He was always like on the road and uh, sh uh, like you know, we partied pretty hard together. We were, we were young, but we partied pretty hard together. She lived in Westchester. I lived in New York city. Was she cool? Super cool. And she was pretty hot too at that age. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> did, yeah. did she give you any stories about Ace Freely? Um, you know, like she kind of kept her, it was weird, man. We were young. I, I mean, I started partying when I was a very young kid, which, you know, is why I'm sober now, 17 years. But uh, I started partying very young and we would go to these like raves all over the East Coast. And, you know, and so we pretty much hung out on the weekends at these crazy parties. 
And, uh, and now it's like, uh, you know, we were like 16. I was 16. She was 15. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus. You were yeah. young. Yeah, 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 yeah. Super young. Yeah. And yet, I, I, well, your parents were cool with that? I moved out of my parents' house when I was 15. So I was a crazy kid. I was a really crazy kid. Super crazy. Um, but, That's you know, awesome. I, like, yeah, I really hope to God that my two sons do not uh, simulate what it was, you know, my childhood. Cause yeah, I'll kill them. Don't, don't tell them and make it exciting. You know, don't yeah. make it sound exciting. I have two sons too. Uh, but uh, that's, that's good side, good side note. That's a crazy story. But I, uh, yeah, anyway, so I signed up, joined the kiss army um, and they would send me letters in the mail with like keychains and stickers and they would get people to call the radio stations to play their music. So if you think about it, it's like an analog way to influence people. And I was, I'd buy all their albums and I'd like pour over them and I would go to their shows and I'd wear face paint and I was just got like hardcore into it. And I realized that between watching TV ads and what, what they really did as a, as a band is they had, they created story and mythology and branding. You know, the kiss lettering was like super consistent. They had, they had their, their characters that, you know, spaceman, demon, cat, star child, and they had all these backstories and it's shit they made up. You know, they were playing in clubs in New York for like 10 people, same music, no face paint, no story. They created then this mythology and the story and they became, you know, one of the best selling bands of all time. And so subconsciously, I was that, that was sort of like, oh, man, I just there's something about this band and the storytelling that I was really into. And so to me, that was like the first exposure of being sucked in and being a brand loyalist and, and really being in, into something. And it was their story that sold me because their music is is not amazing you know what i mean like they're they're not the beatles but they had something else uh they had they had story and mythology and i dove into that and so what was I, their story well just the story of the characters they created that they were from another world and you you believed it it was very theatrical you know it was mm -hmm. made up it was made up it was mythology but every time you saw them they were in their face paint and the demon was in the same character spitting up blood, you know, and Ace was like an alien from outer space and he acted like it, you know? And so they really just stayed in, in their story and in their characters and they had comic books and TV show specials and, you know, had their lunch boxes, and everything you can imagine. They, and they sell everything, you know, it's really Gene and Paul were like the two guys that kind of ran the whole thing. But they sold everything from, uh, you know, kiss condoms to kiss coffins, you know, like everything from preventing life all the way to death. They mm -hmm. sold merch around their their look and their story all the way through. And you would read like they'd send letters from like the cat and it would be like his story or the star child who was like the lover. And he would write everything about you know, in a romantic way, you know what I mean? Can I, can I just comment on that? And I know yeah. that we're getting through your story, man, but I, I like, it's just, as I, I think that, that hearing somebody's story inspires me so much and, and, and it, and it obviously provokes questions, right? Like brand is so important. Yeah. Uh, brand. And, and this is a great example of why brand is so important. So anybody who's listening here, you know, for me, it's always been about brand. It's always been about like brand first, brand first, brand first. If you yeah. can get the, if you can get people to believe the brand, you can kind of almost sell anything. And, and uh, you know, I've been sort of roadblocked over the years as a, as a creative entrepreneur you know, trying to do other things uh, with the brands that I've created. Um, I'm launching a new brand and I'm going totally against the grain. I'm launching a brand that is a wellness brand, but I'm going to sell apparel, clothing, and nutritional CPG products. And some people are like, how, why would you like, why would you bring those two things together? 
It makes and total so, sense to me. I mean, I, someone like you could totally appreciate it. And guys like Gary Vaynerchuk, who's the lead investor, like yeah. for, for me, it's if you can create a brand that people believe in and can trust and rely on, you can, you can, and, and it's genuine and authentic. In my opinion, you can do anything with it, especially if the name is somewhat ubiquitous. Like if I was launching a food brand and I called it, you know, oatmeal, um, then it would be hard for me to try to sell hoodies. Any, any, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like if you come up with a really cool name of a brand that you believe is going to serve a purpose and be of service to others, yeah. not just make money, you can kind of do anything. And that's like, sounds to me like, like Kiss probably could have opened up a restaurant and it would have crushed in their heyday, right? Definitely. Like, yeah, totally. I think that's a good, that's a good point. Like to me, the, 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 how to build a brand is really, it's pretty simple. I mean, I think you, you've mentioned it a lot, but there's like three things that a powerful brand has. It's a, it's a simple message that it stands for, you know, the name's easy to understand, easy to pronounce. And then there's a simple message, you know, why that brand exists, you know, the soul of that brand, what the purpose of that brand is. Then it's consistent. You know, it looks the same. You, it, it's got the same tone. It's got the same voice. You're not changing it every year to be something else. I'm not talking about products. I'm talking about the brand right? The brand is simple. You know what it stands for. It's consistent over time. And then the third piece is there's some type of involvement marketing where you're getting a community to help market your brand for you. And that's a really important piece. And I, if I look at the KISS story, it was super consistent, but they could do a million products, but it was consistent the way it looked and showed up and, and how it you know, was out in the world. It was really simple. They, they, there's four guys playing rock and roll. They each had a backstory. And then the involvement was they got their hardcore fans to do a lot of the, you know, word of mouth for them. And when I look at any brand, your, your new brand, anything Gary's launching, whatever, the, those three rules are, are you know, the, the sort of base of building a strong brand. And I think that's um, subconsciously, I didn't know it, but I was drawn in and sucked in and became part of the KISS Army. I mean, they had an army. That was like their involvement marketing piece, you know, which today would be influencers on TikTok and everywhere else. But, you know, they, they coined it uh, at this army. When we worked with Method Cleaning Products, it was the people against dirty was their community, you know. That was, you signed up for it, you bought into the products, they sent you emails about what they stood for, and you bought into it. You were, you were in the People Against Dirty group. Um, so, you know, Peloton, one of the brands that, that we market, their, their, fan, their membership is, is core to their success. It's, they're not just making great technology products or leading the at-home fitness category. When you sign up and you join their Facebook group, there's thousands of other members that welcome you into the community. And, and it's really about you're doing something at home, but there's a, there's a community behind it. And I think that, that, there, that today in today's world, there's nothing like community building brand, but those three rules, you can apply that to anything you launch. And if you do it right, you have a much better chance of being successful. Can you, can you just clearly define those three real quick, one more time, those three bullets? Sure, like simple, um, the, the brand stands for kind of one thing. Like, I don't know what your brand is, but it's about making people, I don't know, live a healthier life or whatever the purpose is, or maximizing their potential, whatever it might be. That's what you stand for, you know. Um, uh, uh, we know what Patagonia stands for, right? That's an example everyone uses but clarity in what you stand for, not what you make, why the brand exists in the world. Um, you know, Ben and Jerry is one of our clients. They, they sell ice cream, everyone knows that. But why they exist in the world 
is to build a more progressive, healthy planet. You know, like they, they stand for something beyond just selling ice cream. So a simple idea of why you exist, consistent message, look and feel over time, tone of voice, and then community is the third. You know, I call it involvement marketing, but creating assets where your hardcore fans can spread your message for you. So you're not just having to pour oodles of money into media, you know, to buy reach and frequency, but you're letting your, your audience, your hardcore audience, you're giving them the tools to, to evangelize what you uh, what you stand for. All right, so you're you're uh, you're you're a Kiss Army guy. And oh yeah, what? back to that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, you're like, all right, switching gears. Yeah, so I'm a Kiss Army guy. I watch commercials. Um, I love experiencing things out in the world. Um, you know that, that was that was sort of it, and those those things like got ingrained in the back of my head, and I always, as I got older and older, well, I was always interested in like you know, ads of, of some kind and what they were selling. And then I went to school for uh, economics. And um, I thought, uh, I thought that was like a safe thing. Like I'd be, a, you know, I'd be a businessman and start a business and I'd take finance classes. And then somewhere in college, the, the kind of third wave was um, I took a uh, a, a world religion class and an art history class. And to me in college, those were my two favorite courses that I've ever taken. And world religion was understanding what people believe in and their different beliefs and why in different cultures. And then art history to me was understanding how art really reflects the time period that it was created in and, and developed in. And at that point, I, you know, I finished my economics degree, but that's sort of in college when I like tied it all together of, I like, I like TV ads. <laughs> I loved Kiss when I was a kid and I'm into, you know, cultures and I'm into visuals of the moment in, through time. And that's when I put it together that, oh, I'm like a marketing guy. I need to go into advertising marketing as a career. And then as soon as I got out of school, I, you know, applied to like a thousand different places and kind of moved my way through the system. And then I, I worked at a lot of different agencies learning what I liked about the cultures there, what I didn't like about the cultures, how to do the actual job. And then 15 years ago, started a mechanism with, with three other friends. And that's the road we've been on since. And so my whole career has been, I didn't do like five pivots to find my thing. I sort of figured it out. Um, and then that's, that's what I know. You know, I put in my 10,000 hours and somewhat mastered it. And that's, that's what I know. I want to talk about the moment uh, of clarity that you had after working at a number of different agencies to then take the leap of entrepreneurialism and go out and start your own thing. Do you, can you recall a moment where you were like, it's time? Um, yes, yeah, sort of. I had, um, it kind of worked itself out. I knew I wanted to do it and I was waiting for the, you know, stars to align and my, what does that mean? I don't know. I was just like waiting for, some sign or gut feeling for it to be like, all right, now it's time to do this. But I knew, I knew that that's the path I was on since I started, you know, like I knew I had that bug uh, to start something and, and not just always move through different agencies and work for people, but to, that, Hey, I think I could start my own. Um, I'm just as smart as these other people that are doing it. So why shouldn't I do it? my way with my values and, and my approach. And so I did start, the first business I started was a, was a production company. And as I started that business, I did it all on my own. And I don't know if you have partners in your businesses or what, but after a year of starting that and doing it all on my own, uh, I was super fried and burned out and, and in a really bad headspace and mentally not healthy at all. 
And then my across town, my friends had sort of been doing some digital production work on their own. And we sort of met up and said, all right, let's do this thing together and start something. And that's that was really the, the point in time. Two quick questions that popped up. So when you say you were doing it on your own, do you mean that you were you had like you were obviously running the show? Did you have any people around you that you had hired to work with you or was it all freelancers? I had a um, freelancer in Atlanta that was a friend of mine and we partnered together a bit. And then the two guys that ran the agency that I was formerly at, um, they, they sort of in, invested in me starting this thing. Um, uh, Vince Angle and Wayne Buda were two guys that I've worked with. They, they, they sort of understood I wanted to do this other thing. And so they, they helped me start it. Um, but I was pretty much on my own, you know, so doing I, like the, the invoicing, the pitching, overseeing the production, executive producing, you know, the whole thing. I've got a really interesting philosophy about partnership <clears throat> and it's my own personal experience. Right. Uh, and it's also probably because I, and I can sense from you similarly, I'm an alpha and I have a, and I'm a visionary. And so, uh, you know, when you have a partner outside of my marriage, because I, I love my wife dearly and I've, we've been married for a long time and a partnership is a partnership, right? Whether How long? It, we've been married 14 years oh, together. Congrats. 16. Awesome. Thanks. Um, but, you know, the way I approach my marriage is, is, is different than the way I approach a business partnership. What I've learned along the way in partnership is that, you know, we're taught from an early, early, early on that when you start a business with a partner, you're trying to find somebody or you should find somebody that has a complementary skill set to you. Meaning if you're really creative, you should find somebody that's really logistical and operational um, or vice versa so that there's, there's no stone unturned in the business. And, you know, both, both elements are, are really um, are covered by an owner. Uh, so there's a lot of passion that goes into ownership, of course. And what I learned about that is in some cases, I'm sure that works out really well, but typically a creative person is the visionary in the brand or in the business and the operational logistical person doesn't really care too much about the vision of the business more so cares about keeping the lights on and making sure that it works right. Like you plug this thing in and the light turns on. Um, and the visionary is much more concerned about how it looks and how it feels and how it makes others feel and the community around it. Um, and so it doesn't lend, that, that kind of thinking doesn't really lend itself too much to understanding like how the electricity works or how the water is coming through the pipes. Um, and so, as a company grows, a lot of decisions need to be made, of course, especially as it starts getting bigger and bigger. And when that happens, decisions get more challenging to, to make and challenges get more difficult to power through. And if you have somebody that thinks creatively and somebody that thinks logistically, typically, they, I mean, not typically, like scientifically, they think differently. Um, yeah, definitely. And so there's a lot of headbutting, right? Because, you know, if you have the, the, the courage to go open up a business, typically you're, you're, you're a strong, you know, opinionated person. And when you get two strong opinionated people together to try to make a decision on one thing, when they both think differently, it creates, you know, it creates a bit of friction. And so I, I've had a number of situations like that with partners where it just gets, it gets really, really tough. Yeah. My philosophy going forward is not not to have partners, but if you do choose a partner, be in alignment, both be creative or both be operational. And that's fascinating to me. So the reason why I say that is because doing it alone is not easy, as you've learned throughout yeah. your, your journey, it's right? Not, like it's, 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 not easy. it's hard. It's really hard. Um, it's depressing and lonely. It's tough. It's and tough, yeah. and so if you have two people that are aligned, completely aligned, 
decision making is pretty simple. You make great decisions. And the way I like to, I call them editors, is you hire a team around you that, that does not have the ability to make final decisions to help edit your decision-making process. It's a lot easier to hear from somebody who doesn't have a, a finite ability to make a decision, tell you, hey man, you know, you're doing 60 in a 30 and there's speed bumps and you're driving a hoopty. You might wanna push the brakes because you're probably gonna lose the chassis if you hit that bump. And it's up to me and my partner potentially, who's you know in the car right next to me doing 60, like let's go to say, okay, that's a great insight. Maybe we should think about that. Or, hey, what you don't know is that like we have actual like suspension on this vehicle and we're gonna be able to hit that bump, no problem. So I, gotcha. I appreciate you. So, <laughs> you know, I, I have now created a team of people around me in my new company uh, that are absolutely operational killers. They're operational killers. And is this a company you're launching? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And they're operational killers and they edit me every step of the way. However, I have the ability to say, thank you so much. I'm going to take your advice or so sorry, this is what we're doing. You know, let's figure out the best possible way to get through the solution in this, in this direction. Yeah. And so that's my philosophy on it. And it could be, it could be off and wrong. Um, but I do believe that alignment and vision is so goddamn important for a business. And when you have two people that think very, very differently, or three people or four people that think very differently, decision making is very hard. Uh, and and there's nothing more important than the vision for the business and and the trajectory, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Like it's all about vision. I mean, that's the whole game, you know, and and staying true to that vision and change tweaking it and knowing where you're going like that decisiveness is everything without that you're you're going nowhere yeah yeah so, so i i just but you, my you, philosophy my, my philosophy is different than yours but it's good to hear yours um and i think it's also this is where the maid comes in because this is ha this happens through experience right like if you had experience in your past where you were not moving forward because you're locking heads, you're going to have that new belief of, all right, well, I'm going to make sure I have 51% and I have, you know, I can make, I can call the shots. Right. And I might have other minor partners with input, but ultimately like I'm, I'm the captain, you know, even, and, even, if, even but, yeah. but just to say, even if you, even if you have 51% and somebody else has 49. Yeah. The point is, is that those of us who have the desire to open up our own businesses tend to have strong opinions on what they're doing. And so even if someone has 49% and they don't have the absolute ability to make a decision, there's still a battle. And battles yeah. stop progression. That's the truth, right? Like there's yeah. nothing better than being able to wake up in the morning knowing you've got to like a football team, right? A, a successful football team walks onto the field with the same exact vision for the outcome of what they're about to do. Uh, right. We're going to win this fucking game. The quarterback's going to throw the ball. I'm going to catch it. He, the, the, you know, like that's the vision. That's the alignment. And they power through and, and successful ones win. Yeah. Unsuccessful things that I can point to as an example of are bands that you absolutely love. You love them. They're amazing. They're amazing. Amazing bands. Right. And then they just disappear and you're like, what yeah. the hell happened? And someone's like, oh yeah, you know, the lead singer got into a battle with the fucking drummer and that's it. It's over. You know yeah, what I'm the, saying? The, there's some ego involved somewhere. Yeah. There's yeah. some, some control power grab. That yeah. happens. Yeah, that happens. It happens in bands all the time. I'm I'm just in the particular case where we have uh, four people from different backgrounds. I'm from the agency space. One of my partners is from tech. One's from design, and one's in, sort of in the di directorial production space. But we came at it from all these different views, 
which sort of worked because we had our own area that we were sort of controlling for lack of a better word. And we each have 25% of the pie. So it's equally distributed, um, which you would think that balance would be hard or there'd be three against one and there'd be, you know, there'd be like different teams. Um, but I think we've, for some lucky reason, and I would not recommend doing it this way. Like this is not a, a setup for success. We just happen to um, trust each other and know what each person's good at. And we have our fucking fights and problems like everyone else. But it's uh, it's worked for us, but I think it's highly unusual. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's let's continue on. I think this is why this works so well, because you tell your story, bring something up. I, I get inspired and then we go off on a really interesting tangent and then we can bring it right back. I like it. It's it's awesome. Yeah. So um, we yeah, then we started Mechanism about 15 years ago. And uh, as you know, with any business, I mean, we're in the we're in the service business. It's a grind. And we had started slow and and when you talk about legacy you know we we didn't take any investment money it was all we it was all organic growth and we grew every year uh, almost went out of business probably three times uh had a couple of hail marys come in you know projects come in at the last minute where we could make payroll and survived and um you know then we got to a point maybe in like 20 10, 2011, where we started to have a bit of a name and a reputation and clients starting to come to us for, for, versus us chasing down clients. And I think that's when it started to turn. And now, you know, we're 200 people, four offices. Uh, the, you know, there's still problems and headaches like with any business, but you're, you're secure. You know, you know that you have like something in the market that people have heard of. You're going to get clients, you're going to grow. You're going to do great work. Um, it's just how, how much more you want to grow because as Americans, we are wired to never stop growing. You know, I think in any business, once you turn that corner of we're going to, we're going to get, I want to get big, then your, then your momentum, you know, you're, you're hiring, your overhead's high, you're, you know, you're just uh, chucking towards growth and growth and growth and growth and growth. Not every business has to do that. You know, there's really some successful businesses that want to be five people, make a lot of money and stay that way. You know, once you cross that threshold and make that decision and you have 50, 75, 100, whatever employees, the only way to move is, is through inertia to grow and grow and grow. That's the path we're on now, you know? Um and this is probably a tough question for you to ask, but, you know, I got to ask it and feel, feel free to say no. Um, you know, you're, you're a highly celebrated agency. You've worked with some of the biggest brands we all know of today. You just listed a few of them. Yeah. What brand have you worked with? Not that you've enjoyed working with the most, but that you've learned the most from the experience in working with. That is such a good question. Oh, man. That is tough. It, it just changes all the time. I'm like always, I'm always a student and learning something different, you know? Um, so I, I, I can't, I can't pinpoint one brand. Um, you know, there's, we just launched some work with OkCupid, dating app, right? Um, the way, the way they go for broke with the work that we do is, uh, I'll, I'll send you some of the work we just launched this week. I've, I kind of learned from them that, uh, you know, fearless work pays much better dividends than uh, smart, smart, safe work. And I've seen it, I've seen it uh, from the work we do with them. It's just uh, really, 
going for the going for the jugular. And, and so, I, I so that. talk to me about that fearless work. I love that. So, fearless work. What does that mean? I mean, it is just uh, you know some of the work we we launched this week. It got banned in a couple different cities because it was deemed inappropriate. And uh, another brand that, the, the, or that our team launched was uh, Frida. And we, it was the first time we had breasts shown on uh, national TV. I think it was like the Golden Globes. And we got the TV standards changed because it was, it was a uh, you know, breast care line for, for postpartum women. And I think just that to me, I'm just always kind of learning that it's not doing shocking work, but it's doing culturally disruptive work uh, that makes people uncomfortable has a massive impact. And you're gonna turn off a lot of people, uh, but you're gonna get people talking and you're gonna get a lot of people that love you even more for it. And those are the people you want, you know, going back to community. And so safe work today is like wallpaper and you, we all know it, you know, we all skip past it waiting for the thing we want to watch, whether it's like on, on, on YouTube, on social, whatever, that work is just wallpaper that we don't notice. And so if you're going to be spending money and you're going to build a brand, it better be like a shock to the system. You know, it better make people take notice. And I think that to me is, it's not right for every brand, but that to me is, um, you know, like one of our brands is Quaker, 140 year old brand, trusted, um, they don't need to have fearless work. They don't need to shock people because that's not, that's not akin to the brand. That's not that simple formula of what the brand stands for. But new brands, um, insurgent brands, brands that are coming to market, you really got to make people stop in their tracks in order to get their attention. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's I, not enough now just to have like nice packaging and a cool font. You know what I mean? You got to really have like a stake in the ground and stand for something and, and get people to be like, all right, I'm, I'm paying attention. You know, I think you brought something to, you just put such a huge smile on my soul um, oh, good. because I'm, you really did, man, because I'm launching a brand um, called creatures of habit. And oh, cool. um, there's a, there is a, we, we just did a content shoot and I came up with this idea for the brand. So, you know, the brand was born out of my ability to change uh, bad habits into great ones. Right. Uh, and I'm selling products that will ultimately give people an opportunity to, to do the same because everything for me is about the decisions that we make. And if you make decisions for consistently for a long enough period of time, they become habits and uh, yeah, that's I talk about that in my book. If you if you do if you change your behavior and practice it over time, that becomes habitual and, and subconscious. Uh, yeah, almost that, ritualistic. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. And so I came up with this idea that I got a lot of pushback from almost everybody that saw it. But it's a pretty profound um, picture that I that I had the photographer take. And uh, I, I don't, I, you know, like, but, but, but hearing you say that to me really just made me feel like, you know, it's something that I should do. And I think that anybody that's listening, you know, I think Jason makes this incredible statement of this fearless work because there's so much out there, right? Like we are, we are pounded with advertising all day long, everywhere we look, it, you know, it's everywhere. And if you're not doing something that's going to make people think, well, then you're not going to make them notice you, that's right? right? Yeah. And I think a great example of this, and I, I, you know, this is an example that I think everybody can agree to, is the Trump campaign, right? Like, if there was, if there was one, if there was one um, thing that has been pounded into all of our globally over the last you know, five years, it's this guy who says he's not going to take shit anymore. And, you know, and I'm not saying yeah, it's, totally. it's, it's good or bad. I, I'm not saying I believe or I don't, but yeah. I am saying that like, 
he, that man understands how to get people's attention. Right. Definitely. And so like, I'm not saying create the Trump campaign when you're launching your new business, or if you're already in business and you're looking for something to, to, to pick up steam with, but doing something that is, um, is remarkable in regards to getting people's attention is really important. It's really important. Yeah. And I, I would, I would just say, you know, like, let's say a brand, like, um, one of our brands, like Jose Cuervo, um, everybody knows that brand, right? So it's less, you don't, you don't have to, you just have to reinforce what that brand stands for. Like that's your job with Jose Cuervo is remind, it's like reminding people that they're there. They were the first tequila. They were the original heritage. You don't have to like, you know, shock people, right? You don't have to necessarily do fearless work for established brands. But new brands, creature, creatures of habit, whatever you're launching that's new and new brands are typically challenging the status quo and doing something different or challenging convention and disrupting. And so they have to then market themselves in a disruptive way so you know what the soul of the brand is and why they're there and why, they, why, why you need them in the sea of all the shit we have, you know, and, and all the messages and all the brands out there why do we need this new, new thing? Like it, there's going to be something that's like it already. Why do we need this new thing? And so your marketing has to express that and you have to really search to find what that fearless idea is. That's going to get people, get people talking and, and have them want to be part of it. Um, it's much easier said than done, but it's in there. You know, when you see a brand for the first time, um, what do you, how do you analyze a, a brand? Like what, 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 what do you think about when, when either, uh, when, a, when, a, when there's a potential client and you're deciding whether or not to work with them or not, or, or you choose to work with them and you start to deep dive on the brand? Like, what are your, what are your thought processes? I mean, a lot of times it's, um, do I, do I believe in what their, what the product is? You know, do I, do I believe in the people? Do I believe in what the product is? So when we, we started working with, you know, we, we pitched to work on Peloton, you know, five years ago when they had 3%, 3% unaided awareness. So that means like nobody, nobody knew who they were. Right. And so, you know, you, you have to take a bet. Are we going to, are we going to pitch this? And if we win it, work with them. And are people going to buy a $2,500, you know, exercise bike, <laughs> you know, like, is that, is that thing, is that a real thing? And, you know, you, you kind of gut instinct, you look at the people, you learn about the product and the business, and then you go, yeah, this is, I think this is going to be massive. And you, you just get that, like, you got to trust your gut and, and, and kind of go in. And I've done a lot of, you know, equity deals where, you know, we'll, we'll do services at a discount and get, try to get some equity. And I think I've done five of them and only one of them's panned out. So I'm not saying my gut is, is razor sharp, you know, but you know, you, you take some bets and, and some of them you win. That's so funny. I was going to call you after this conversation and, and ask if you wanted a little chip for, for some work. <laughs> oh, there you go, man. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the question is like, how do you know kind of what to bet on? And I think, you know, you've, you know, this is kind of the born or made podcast, but either if you are born or made, you've done, you've done enough hours and reps that you sort of know what's going to work and what doesn't work. You know, um, I just have a few more questions cause I know we're running out of time. Yeah, sure, man. Um, campaigns are basically the the definition of what makes you as an ad agency successful or not right like something that stands out that people will remember for ever potentially yeah yeah in the last 10 years can you point to a campaign or, or a few campaigns that you think have been some of the most profound in the industry and why sure like 
want something that we've done or just in general could be something that you've done or just you know yeah um well we did um we did a campaign for med men that was you know the first it was a first ever you know broadcast cannabis campaign and that to me was remarkably breakthrough and i think will be a, a footnote somewhere um, in the history of advertising. And so that, that campaign, um, it's called the new normal. That was one that I'm, you know, really proud that, that this company did. Um, and then I'm, I'm trying to think of some other, like, just, just groundbreakers, just like bangers, um, that, uh, that, that like sort of rise above the rest. And I'm trying not to go cliche with like, the brands that everyone's going to mention, uh, you know, but I think, um, you know, Do Dollar Shave Club, when Michael Dubin launched that thing with that viral video, that to me was another just classic moment in time of hitting the right tone with a new product, you know, kind of one of the early direct to consumer products right on the heels of like when viral videos were popping up and the tone of it was just, he, he just kind of got lucky and caught lightning in a bottle at the right time. And to me that um, that's like a historical one, you know, to me. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I always think about is uh, the ultimate driving machine is the longest running tagline. It's like 45 years. And to me, when we talk about consistency, uh, that's one of my favorite things of all time because it's such a fucking killer line that new, no new CMO can come in and come up with anything better. Can I? Can I? <laughs> can I try to figure out what it is? What? It's, it, you have a line in mind, right? I just said it. What was it? The ultimate driving machine, BMW. Oh, oh. <laughs> what was yours? Just do it. Oh yeah, just do it. Yeah, I see. I can't. That's obvious, but I can't cliche that one. Uh, but anyways, BMW to me is like up there. Yeah, the ultimate driving machine. And then, um, yeah. So that one, the Dubin story, Dollar Shave Club story. I mean, think about that guy. He sold the company for a billion bucks, kind of off of a viral video. Like that. That's that turbocharged the company. Um, we got everyone talking about it and obviously they made great products. They sent them on time. They were cheap. Um, they, they built community too, cause they put in, uh, a little newsletter whenever you got your razors that you could read on the toilet, you know, that was mm -hmm. like, like sort of this community newsletter. So they kind of had community down too. Yeah. So the, the other, the other question that I have, and I think that this is something that, you know, the listener can take away with them. Um, that you can probably apply because you said you know there's three principles um, that make a brand successful yeah and it's sort of just like an easy to understand consistent name and and sort of vision of the brand how it shows up yeah um, message uh, so the mission of the brand why they what they stand for and community yeah out of those three things what do you think is the most important for a brand to succeed long-term? Um, I think what they stand for is, is the most important thing. And, and why? Because you can get investment money and you can have hot shit design and packaging and you can blast your message out there and you'll probably do pretty well. And so community... We'll, we'll be there and you'll have, you'll have consumers. You might not have community, but you'll have enough consumers to make yourself successful. Community is really about enlisting the people that, that are core to your product to market for you. So I think you can do that in other ways without that community. And then consistency, if you stay on message, you know what you stand for, but every two years you change your look and feel, but you're still on that that simple message of why you were founded, 
I think you can also still be successful. So I think um, that's the most important one is why you were born as a brand and what you're out to do in the world and what you want to change and who you're fighting against and what you're going to disrupt. And that has to be the thing. That elevator pitch has to always be the same thing. And if that changes, you're fucked. You're done. Um, two last questions. Yeah. Piece of advice that uh, either you want to give yourself or that's been given to you that you like to pass down. Um, this is what I need to work on. So I don't know if that falls into that. I'm never, I'm always, I'm always happy, but I'm never satisfied. And I think that's good uh, for people like us that are entrepreneurial and always looking for the next thing. But it's also maybe not always healthy. I think, um, you know, celebrating the wins that you have and not blowing past them so quickly is something I need to, as I get older, I need to really sit back and, and lean into and reflect on. You know, I'll get a win. I'll get a win. I'll move on to like that's cool. What what's better than that? What's the next thing? I don't think that's that's a healthy way to way to mentally think for your entire life. I couldn't agree more, man. I preach that constantly. Celebrate the wins. It's so fucking important. All right, dude. This was an awesome conversation. There's so much here that we're going to be able to have a good time with, and um, and I know is just bringing so much value. Um, we we really talked about a lot, and I think that the, all the stuff that we talked about in in you know the world of brands can be applied to just life in general. Right? Absolutely. Like, yeah. This is all. This is all trying to be best and trying to be better, or not necessarily trying to be the best, but trying to be better. Uh, I always ask the question at the end of the podcast, um, whether or not you think you were born or made. So Jason Harris, um, what's the answer here, man? Do you think you were born or made to crush it the way you are today? Uh, I'd probably, I think I was born. I think I was born. Um, yeah, I, I thought about that a lot. I think it's both, you know, ultimately it's both, but if I had to pick one, I think I was, uh, I was born this way. It's the way my mind's wired and, uh, it's just kind of the way, I, the way I think and, uh, how I approach life. And I think that that was, that came out when I was born. Dude, this was awesome. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I know you're a busy dude. I really, really appreciate it. There's so much value here. I can't wait to post this episode. It'll go up in the next week or two. You're the fucking man. I love um, you. Ditto, man. Yeah, I love you too. This was awesome. And I, uh, I also have like a whole thing on my pillars from sort of my the way I think about life that uh, we'll get to another time. But that'd be fun to chat about too. Just spit them out for us real quick because I think oh, they're they're you know they're basically how I built the company and sort of how I think about personal growth and it's it's originality, it's uh, generosity, it's empath empathetic and it's uh, soulfulness and those those four rules you know I've got them like on my arm and symbols for them and that's what I I wrote the book on those four things I think everyone should have a creed or a set of beliefs or a code and it should be three to five things and they should uh, write them down and follow them. And I think that's, that's an important part of, of the made part <laughs> of, of how you build something. So, yeah, I believe in that. I love it, man. That's right on dude. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. And, uh, Thank you, Michael. Keep crushing, dude. Keep paving the way, man. It's uh, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible to see. Yeah, ditto, man. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. See ya.